house. I've been down here before. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. It is nice and comfy. Um, let's get straight to it, I suppose. Were you disappointed not to get a job in government? Well, listen, like most members of the public, I'm sick of listening to politicians say they were disappointed <laughs> or <laughs> insulted <laughs> or upset. So I'm not going to fall for any of that uh, language. I, listen, when the Taoiseach phoned me, and in fairness to him, he had a difficult task. He only had a certain number of positions. But when he phoned me, you know, one of the points I made to him and I've made it publicly is that I thought it would have been preferable had Fianna Fáil held either the justice or foreign affairs portfolios. I said to him, I thought that was a mistake. In fairness to him, he had limited numbers of positions and portfolios to seek. So that's the only point I really make in respect of it. But were you frustrated then, I suppose, not to be part of the negotiating team? Because if you had been, wouldn't you have had a say in what portfolios the party got? And again, Maggie, I'm neither frustrated, (laughs) disappointed, insulted or upset. Listen, it's difficult if you're a party leader to select a negotiating team and then to select uh, cabinet ministers. And I suppose if you think of the position of other people who were negotiating for months, I think of Anne Rabbit and Thomas Byrne, they didn't end up in the cabinet when the decisions were being made. So it's it's a tough decision for the Taoiseach. They got junior positions. Well, they took the junior positions. It's a tough decision for the Taoiseach to make. And it was always going to be a a tough decision Mm -hmm. for him. But listen, I had to make a decision as well. Uh, You made the decision then not to take the junior position that you were offered, um, which would have given you a a bit of a a say and a bit of a sway. So talk us through that decision then. Why, Why did you decide not to take the junior job? Well, it was a difficult decision as well. But obviously... I think it was a decision that was right for me. Like my own assessment is that uh, certain junior ministries are a very limited role. In particular now, when you look at justice, the equality section of it has been taken away. Like we saw David Stanton in the last government. He had a very busy and important portfolio in terms of being involved in direct provision. That was going to be taken away. The integration was taken away. Immigration, uh, really, in terms of direct provision, is going to be dealt with by Roderick O'Gorman. So, listen, I just thought from my own point of view, assessing what I thought was a limited role and what I could do outside government, I thought it was preferable and more beneficial for the party and indeed the country for me to stay outside. How did you did think... You actually, yeah, I'm sorry to no, cut no, across you, Maggie. I was yeah. just wondering, how long did you actually think about it or get time to think about these things? Or had you already sort of sized it up before well, the call was made? I, I was conscious that obviously the cabinet decision is made on the Saturday poll and then the decision was going to be made by the Taoiseach on the Wednesday. So I suppose I had... Uh, an, an, an expectation that maybe I was going to be offered it. So in advance of the Taoiseach calling, I would have been able to consider it. But I gave yeah. it very careful consideration. It's not something that you just uh, jump into immediately. But I had to just reflect on it from my own point of view, what I thought I could do outside government and in terms what I thought I would be doing inside government. I made a decision. Listen, I may be here in a year or two from now and you may be saying to me, Jim O'Callaghan, you made the worst decision of your life. Do you regret it? Mm -hmm. I don't regret it. I think it was the right decision for me. But who knows what the future will hold. Talking about the future then, because you wrote in in the Independent last weekend some of the stuff that you want to do. You said, I want to play my part in advancing policies and strengthening our great party so it can attract younger people. Uh, so so this idea that you're going to the back benches now to to strengthen the party, uh, what, how, how are you going to do that from the back well, benches? So that's a responsibility that rests on every TD and senator in Fianna Fáil. And I think it's a particular responsibility on those TDs and senators who aren't in ministerial office because it becomes extremely difficult when you're in government and you're dealing with the day-to-day issues of governance of a country for ministers to be concerned about and directly involved in the protection of a party's identity. It's going to be extremely important for Fianna Fáil from the point of view of protecting our identity whilst in government. But there's a point I want to make, and it's not as though this is anything novel or desperately original. But if you look at the Orte exit poll from the last general election, you can see that in the 18 to 24 years of age group, Fianna Fáil secured only 13.6% of the vote. That's a problem for us. And if we're going to prosper as a political party, we need to face up to that. And secondly, when you look at the other issues that are happening in politics around the world, there is increasing polarisation going on in our politics around the world. Look at Britain, look at the United States, where people are being categorised into antagonistic groups And it's damaging the politics and it's debasing the politics in those countries. My view, and it's in the national interest, I believe, is that the best way to stop that type of polarisation is for Ireland to have a strong national centre ground party. And that party is Fianna Fáil. And that's why I think Fianna Fáil needs to grow as a national centre left ground party in order to ensure that we can attract young people. And that, in my opinion, 
is in the national interest and it will prevent increasing polarization How? in Irish politics. Mm. How? Because it stops. I mean, the logic of it is clear, what you're saying, mm. and those, it's absolutely clear. If you, if you look at pictures of the Fianna Fáil parliamentary party, you're not seeing, you know, you're looking at the age profile and all the rest of it and you're thinking, OK, this is, has to do something. You're looking at something of the Sinn Féin dynamic. They're really coming. So how would you, from the backbenches, be able to advance that argument and deliver on it and deliver it in Dublin as well, which is also an issue? Well, first of all, what are the issues affecting young people? And the question is, how do we attract more young people? Young people, first of all, they're not burdened with the political prejudices of older people. But if you look at young people now, the biggest issues they have, people who are between, let's look at it, 15 and 24 years of age, youth unemployment now is at 45%. I know that's extraordinary because of the pandemic. If you look at people between 25 and 45, they've been through two recessions. They're completely in the position of economic insecurity. And how we deal with that is we try to ensure that we improve and increase the availability of accommodation so that people aren't burdened with enormous mortgage costs or rental costs. We have to improve their terms of employment. If you look at the terms of employment that young people have now, they're much more insecure than was the case with their parents. And if you look at People who work for the state, such as the three of us here, have the benefit of secure terms of employment. That doesn't apply across the board in terms of uh, young people's employment. So we need to look at improving their terms of employment, increasing the ability they have to secure affordable accommodation. They're the issues that are affecting them. And then when you look at climate change and COVID, like these are we're asking young people to take on board huge burdens. And if you look at it in terms of COVID, the people who are really being affected by COVID are the people in their 20s and 30s whose careers have, in effect, been put on hold because of this. They're going to be damaged long term as a result of that. And also, if you look at climate change, we're asking them again to make changes for the benefit of future generations. So I believe it is important and I will play my part in advancing policies that seek to uh, protect and get the support of People under 45 well, your, years yeah, I mean, your party's in government now, so your colleague Dara O'Brien will be saying that he'll be doing that as, as Minister I know. for, for Absolutely. Health. Absolutely, and I believe and, and he will. And also the Green Party then as well in terms of, of, of climate change. But I'm just wondering, this this idea that you are going to play this role, you know, you've set out your stall very clearly that you want to be a backbencher who will be playing this role. Is it something that the party leadership has asked you to do? It, it isn't. Last night we had a very good parliamentary party meeting and I welcome the fact that uh, the Taoiseach has indicated that there's going to be renewal of the party. But listen, Everyone has a responsibility in Fianna Fáil. Every TD, every senator has a responsibility. I don't think you'll find any backbench Fianna Fáil TD or senator who disagrees with what I'm saying here and who doesn't recognise that they have a responsibility to do the same thing. We all have a responsibility for that. I'll just bring, I'll ask you to put on your headphones because our our, uh, Michal Lahan is in our other studio for social distancing purposes. Um, Michal, you you were kind of covering the the Fianna Fáil parliamentary party um, meeting, I suppose, last night. Um, The mood, I suppose, um, you know, Jim Jim's here in studio and he's he's saying that everybody knows what they need to do. But what is the mood like, would you say, Michal? Well, Jim was in the meeting, so I can only go from what, what people tell me about what was happening in there. And I think business-like seemed to be the tone and talk of re- rejuvenation and renewal and all that type of thing. But of course, some people would say that particular task was something that should have been done successfully on the way into the last election and Fianna Fáil lost seats. Uh, and hence uh, the reason where where they find themselves in a particular coalition that many of them would have found unlikely just a short time ago. Then you have some people like John McGuinness who are already on edge somewhat about the fact, the way that particular questions are being answered in the Dáil by the government, describing them as very Fine Gaelish, uh, as I understand it, and a fear among some in Fianna Fáil that it's going to get more and more difficult to distinguish themselves from Fine Gael and that they could be asked, because there is inevitably some continuity of policies, they could be asked to defend Fine Gael policies dating back a good number of years. So all those fears are there. And of course, they are felt particularly by those who don't hold ministerial office And some of those people who don't hold ministerial office are inevitably, and that's just the way politics works, thinking about that period beyond December 2022 uh, and when possibly could the whole leadership of Fianna Fáil come back on on the agenda. Those thoughts just always exist in a political party, especially when you have that unique circumstance to Irish politics where a Taoiseach's end date uh, has been set down in stone. One other point I just would like to make, Mm. there's something about... Jim's story that I just uh, have never fully understood how someone 
who was there when confidence and supply was essentially conceived uh, and really the detail put on put on it and it happened inside in Jem's kitchen with, with Leo Varadkar. Uh, that was the, the pathway that, that created that 2016 government. How someone like that can suddenly become in the negotiation of this government and he looks to be a central, he is the, he's a real central figure all through the, the 2016 uh, Fianna Fáil grouping. He's the one who is out there when, when it reaches its real high drama around the Francis Fitzgerald thing. Jim O'Callaghan's the one who goes on the news and says that, that, that she has to explain or, or go. And then suddenly coming into that key period of the negotiation, somewhere along the way, Jim becomes what appears to be a peripheral figure in the negotiation. I just never got anything like an explanation for that turn of events. Jim O'Callaghan, give me hold of hand an explanation, please. <laughs> well, it's, it's an interesting question, in, in fairness to Michal, because I can't answer that question. I don't think, however, I am a peripheral figure at present uh, in Fianna Fáil. Michal's correct in pointing out that I was party to the negotiations back in 2016. But just because I was doesn't mean that I necessarily and automatically should be part of subsequent negotiations. I wasn't part... But she'd expect it. But come on. I mean, people listening to this podcast would be thinking, come on, Jim, you, you were expected to be there. You were expected to be the one who would be getting a big job. Oh, thank you very much, Maggie. I agree with you entirely. But <laughs> listen, in terms of the renegotiation of the confidence and supply, which took place, I think it was in 2018, like I wasn't party to that team either. So the, the, the leader doesn't have to select the ta- same team was it something? Well, let me take you back to that weekend, which was okay. You've talked about not wanting to discuss disappointment or anything like that, but it was obviously disappointing the general election in February and the the the, the Saturday of the count. Mihol Martin was on the RTE election special um, that day, coming from his constituency, and he sounded like he was going to start talking to Sinn Fein again. He said, "We'll assess it when the full count is in." But I'm a Democrat. I listen to the people. I respect the decision of the people. The next day, you were on the RTE program Week in Politics. And you said that when you were on the doorsteps, people raised it with you. And the the answer was that you would not go into coalition with Sinn Féin. A month later, uh, you, told or t- you told us here on RTE um, that maybe we were too definitive about saying we wouldn't go in with Sinn Féin. So was a flip-flopping of of what you said about Sinn Féin maybe part of the reason that you've you've maybe fallen out with Michal Martin? I haven't fallen out with Michal Martin. I have a very good relationship with him. I don't fall out with people and in fairness to him, I don't think he does either. In terms of what you say, I don't think any of those reasons are a reason as to why in some respect I wasn't party to the negotiations. Like if you look before the election, and I think we can say it now, we were too definitive before the general election. We said we wouldn't go into government with Fine Gael. We said we wouldn't go into government with Sinn Féin. And in fairness, that worked out well for us in 2016. And that's where we had the confidence and supply. And we got the benefit out of saying, well, you know, we did what we said we would do. But the problem this time was that had we abided by both of those assurances, there would be no government. There would be a general election. So obviously, that's why I think we were t- too definitive before the general election. And we had to move in respect of it. Like anything I said in terms of immediately after the general election was Fianna Fáil policy. But I think, I think what the, the issue was, and once again, you can knock it, but this is what the chattering class were talking about, which was that uh, at a time when Mial Martin was at his weakest, when he was coming into a general election result, which was clear that instead of the mid-50s, it was late 30s, maybe early 40s, but that he was talking about, I hear the listen of the people, I'm a Democrat and I'll abide by what people are saying. He was in a vulnerable position. He was raising a flag that maybe they were going to have to do what they said they weren't going to do and talk to Sinn Féin. And then within 24 hours, you're on the week in politics and you were saying, I was on the doorsteps saying we wouldn't go into Sinn Féin. It's not possible for us to change that position. So it seemed that, you know, he, he had raised a flag and you'd shot him down. And therefore, the chattering classes were saying maybe that was the moment. I don't think so, because anyway, I wasn't party to the renegotiation yeah. of the agreement back in 2018. But listen, I don't believe it was credible for us to say something on a Friday. Yeah. The general elections on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. And then on the Sunday, we turn around and say, well, actually, forget about that. Maybe can I ask you a different question about how the media works and how you as yeah. a pol- politician in- intercede with it? In the run up to an election, 
um, journalism and, and interviews like this can all be about yes or no, black yeah, or white binary. Point, yeah. mm. The second the result is over, we say, sure, there's no difference between any. Why don't you all get together <laughs> and jump to bed? So how do you as a politician navigate that when you're, you know, these are nearly two different types of interview you have to give before the election, after the election? Well, listen, first of all, in terms of a decision that's made, whether we go in, we say we're not going in with Fine Gael, we're not going in with Sinn Féin, you know, that's probably a discussion that needs to be broader based yeah. for the future is my own assessment of it. But in terms of uh, what the, the, the media say, I suppose people are entitled to say, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? But I think politicians maybe need to hold their nerve a bit more in terms of not ruling things out definitively. That, you learn mm. things in politics. Mm. And I suppose we were very definitive before. Like Sinn Féin were definitive before 2016. They said they wouldn't go into government with Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael. And they got criticised for that in the aftermath of the 2016 election because they went off, they weren't involved in negotiations. And they realised, sensibly in my opinion, that that's not a good strategy. And then they changed tack for the 2020 election and they said, oh, we'll talk to anyone. Now, whether the truth of that was correct or not, we don't know. We, we would never really found out as to whether they were serious about it. But I just think in the future, all political parties should perhaps be less definitive in advance because mm. it's a very fractured and fragmented political environment out there now. It's extremely difficult to form a government as the past 150 days have showed. We did pretty well and I think the three government parties in government deserve to be commended for putting together a government that was always going to be difficult. And let me ask you then about the mood within Fianna Fáil this week. What, what is the mood like? The, what was I, the mood like last night? The mood is good. Was, was Fianna Gaelish um, a term that was mentioned? I, 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 un, unlike many of my colleagues, I don't really speak about what happens at parliamentary party meetings in terms of what's said, because I think they're confidential and people should be entitled to say what they want at them. But listen, there's a sense of uh, relief that there's a government. And that's not just in Fianna Fáil. I think there's a, a sense of relief across all the political parties that at least after the election, we have a government in place, we have an opposition in place, and we can get on with the really important task of trying to govern the country through a very difficult time. So relief, I would have thought, is the first uh, characteristic mm. of the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party at present. Um, but you mentioned there the future and what happens in the future, and I suppose you've mentioned party identity. That must be a concern probably for, for backbench MP, um, TDs like yourself. And I'm thinking about maybe your own constituency, Dublin Bay South. You know, you've got yourself there, you've got Fina Gale, Owen Murphy there, and then you've got a Green and a Sinn Féin TD. So looking ahead, you probably don't want to at the moment to the next general election. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm, I can't predict the future. <laughs> no, no, you I'm can't. Very but, sorry, you know? but it must be a, a concern about that identity when you're going to knock on doors now. And if you, if we do end up with a with a successful coalition government, how do you say you're different to somebody know, listen, like Owen Murphy? If you're in your, when, if you're in politics, you can be concerned about everything every day of the week. Okay, you'd never get out of bed if your concerns were going to overwhelm you. Who knows what's going to happen in politics in the future? We've gone through an extraordinary period, not just in Irish politics, but in terms of world politics. Next Next election, there will be three government TDs in Dublin Bay South. That'll be the case in a number of other places. The assumption is that the opposition does better, but who knows? Can I ask you to flip it a different way? I was talking to one senior um, Labour um, politician who had been in the 2011 um, government and I asked him, what was the lesson out of that sort of coalition about how you did it? And he said, we had too many rows in private. Yeah. What we needed to do was have a couple of rows in public, even if they were resolved, but it meant that the wider public knew the fight that we were having on behalf yeah. of whatever voters they mm. were looking for. Would that be? That's a good point, but I'm not going to say what you want me to say, <laughs> which is that you can introduce your podcast by saying, Jim O'Callaghan says we need to have rows with Fine Gael and the Greens. But I think there's validity uh, in that point because part of, part of the reason I think Fianna Fáil didn't do as well as we wanted in the last uh, general election is because we were seen as being too close to Fine Gael in confidence and supply. And there were periods in confidence and supply where we stood up to them, where we were completely different. And I suppose uh, if you look at the polls for confidence and supply uh, during the confidence and supply period, there was a correlation between Fianna Fáil's performance and Fine Gael's performance. When Fianna Fáil was up, Fine Gael was down and vice versa. But then something happened in January that political scientists are going to have to look at in the future. Because for the first time since the 2016 general election, both Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael were down at the same time and Sinn Féin grew. So it was, a, it was a, an interesting political Do you have any phenomenon. idea what happened? Uh, I think we, uh, I think the housing thing was a huge issue. 
I think we were perceived as condoning Fine Gael policy on housing and I think we suffered for that. OK, um, I asked you about the mood in Fianna Fáil, I suppose, and I need to ask you before you go about Barry Cowan this week because obviously that's a story that has overshadowed, I suppose, the first two, uh, the, first, the second week, I suppose, of the, of the new um, government. Um, did he ask you for legal advice four years ago? Four years ago? Uh, no, but if he did, I wouldn't tell you about it anyway, but no, he didn't. Um, should, does he have more questions to answer? Listen, drink driving is an extremely serious matter uh, and it's an extremely uh, consequential uh, crime that people commit, OK? Uh, Barry Cowan's penalty has been paid by him and the extra penalty that a person in public life faces is that they get huge amounts of publicity about it. Like if Paul Cunningham is convicted of drink driving, it's going to be over the newspapers. So somebody in public life is exposed to ridicule and embarrassment because of being convicted of drink driving. And that's what has happened to Barry Cowan. And I think um, he's, he has embar- he said it, he's embarrassed himself, mm. he's embarrassed his constituents, it's bad for the party. But... He's apologised abjectly. But he producing. didn't allow himself to to, to to answer questions that the opposition wanted answered, such as, did he drive on a motorway with a provisional licence? Did he have, did he show L plates when he was driving all those years on a provisional licence? Um, did well, so he... If people want to ask him those questions, ask him. But the opposition wanted to ask him that in the doll, but, but he, he just I know, didn't. but there are other forums. It's not as though the forum is the only avenue or place for persons to be asked questions. In fairness to him and look, I see Pat Buckley uh, from Sinn Féin has the same difficulty today. You know if you, it is extremely serious but the, they were caught by the law the law imposed a sanction on them and a penalty on them and because they're in public life they get the extra sanction on top of that which is public humiliation, public embarrassment and huge amounts of coverage for the breach of the law that they committed. And that's a serious sanction in itself. OK, Jim O'Callaghan, thanks so much for joining us. Um, just one final question. Would you like to be the next leader of Fianna Fáil? Well, that doesn't arise at the moment, Maggie. So we'll, <laughs> But there will be a next leader at some point. At some stage we will. And as Richard Nixon said, we'll jump off that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> Jim O'Callaghan, Fianna Fáil TD. Thank you so much for joining us on Thank the you. Your Politics podcast today. We'll let you go out of the studio and we'll swap in uh, Micheál Lahan, who's been um, in the other uh, studio. But look, while we're doing that, Paul, I want to ask you briefly just about what's been happening uh, with the Dáil sitting in the convention centre this week um, and I suppose the, the business committee as well. There's a bit of wrangling that's going on there about the schedule yeah. and what's happening and, and how it's all working and some TD's not very happy. Mark McSharry, actually, Jim O'Callaghan's colleague, yeah. standing up to say that he thinks it's a waste of money being down in the convention centre. Well, the first thing uh, is something we said last week, which is all of the politicians really dislike being down there. They dislike the fact that they're so spread out um, they decide that they don't have offices which they can retreat to and do their work. And there's also a concern that maybe, you know, bus drivers and teachers are being told that they have to work really closely where they're in this nearly sort of vast expanse. So they don't feel so, that they're... So vast that sometimes the can't go like can't see who's speaking. That vast, <laughs> yes. exactly. And they, they don't think it's particularly showing them in, in a good example. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely concerns about working there. And I think it would be fair to say that most would like to try to get back to Leinster House in some fashion if they can work out how they can organise voting as quickly as possible mm. and then we have had we've had an election of the Taoiseach we've had a cabinet we've had junior ministers we've had for example Sinn Féin announcing its front bench and junior bench so a lot of things are getting into place the committee system that won't really um, kick in until September when we come back after the summer break so one of the other things which is being sort of organised now is the question of the business committee this regulates the work of how the Doyle um, sort of does its business and one of the concerns that um, Fine Gael had out of the way the last Doyle operated was that many back Ventures didn't get the opportunity they felt to, you know, sort of have their say and they want to ensure that in Doyle and Committee they're able to do more. So there's a bit of a row about how the Doyle Business Committee is going to be changed. Mm. Some interesting proposals on the DeHunt system, which I'm certainly not going to try and explain in this podcast. Um, and some of the um, smaller left-wing um, parties, some of the independents, are fearful that um, if the price to be paid by having more backbench speakers is that they get squeezed out. Mm. So there's a bit of a biff on at the moment and mm. um, some movement is likely next week and that's one to be watching closely. Okay. Um, Michal, what did you make of, of what Jim O'Callaghan was saying there really? He's he's still very much um, saying that, you know, nothing really happened between, well, not, he hasn't fallen out with Michal Martin, he yeah. said. I thought it was interesting where he brought it back all the way back to 2018 where mm. he wasn't part of that renegotiation team. So maybe the drift... Uh, and there has to be some there. there has to be some kind of drift for mm. someone who 
sits down in his kitchen with Leo Varadkar acting on Indy Kenny's behalf at the time and manages to put the plan in place for confidence and supply. That's the mine. They're the two mines that lay the foundations for that arrangement. Uh, suddenly isn't part of it. I mean, in, on the Friday night before Cabinet was formed, some of the most senior figures within Fianna Fáil were still scratching their heads and saying that they couldn't really, if you were to go on ability, see a Cabinet without Jim O'Callaghan. Mm. Uh, but that did happen. And and as a result of the things that have transpired since, the, the widespread view is that Jim O'Callaghan is obviously someone who's there uh, as a possible leadership contender in the future down the line when Michael Martin's period as Taoiseach is finished. That's just the reality of it. And he came in here yeah. uh, and, and he was eloquent and he was every inch the senior counsel. He didn't leave any hostage to fortune there, mm-hmm. you know. Well, he certainly left it open, didn't he? I mean, you yeah, know. he did. So yeah. Never ruled it out. Never ruled it out, absolutely. Some Bridges and Nixon, which maybe wasn't <laughs> the best political <laughs> net for 40 years. No, yeah, I was thinking that. But anyway, I'm sure he knew what he was saying. Um, so look, there's still quite a bit of legislation to get through. Uh, you were telling me just off air that they have now come up with the final date for this. So it's going to be the very end of July, July 31st. 31st. We heard today it was going to be 30th, but it's, I think they're squeezing Always another day. Always bring it into Friday, it. yeah. It just yeah. looks good, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fried, that Friday feeling so then for a few weeks to go specific. and in that time then they're going to try and um, get through some legislation so that they'll be able to say to voters look mm-hmm. we're only in a few weeks but we've done X, Y, Z and Micheál was talking about the historic nature of yesterday's legislation going through the thought Yeah, yesterday's legislation the first bit since the foundation of the state that is passed outside the Leinster House although the actual you could argue that the foundation of the state is the treaty vote and that's an earth for terrorists but technically since the technically foundation of the state since. it's the first bit passed outside and of there the wasn't any great well, excitement maybe that's because they're also annoyed at being down there but there was no great sort of drum roll and pomp yeah, and ceremony there, there is there is a fair bit of legislation a lot of it relating to financial supports yeah. for, for businesses but there is one piece that dates back to the budget that is uh, changing the threshold at which the over 70s can qualify for medical cards mm. and making um, GP only cards uh, available to the under 12s that also looks like it's going to can be passed through the house before the end of July. Maybe we could have like a podcast extra where we can get into rows like when was the state founded? Yeah. I know, just for the crack. Yeah, absolutely. You'd need David McCullough though, would you? You would need David Dr. McCullough Dave, and he's please. got he's yeah. he's he's going to be a bit busy now coming up soon, isn't he? He's got a different job to do. So. Um uh, the Green Party leadership uh hustings of course. The Green Party leadership contest is well, would you say it's in full flow? I mean, I can't say that it's particularly you, dynamic. How about I ask you the questions, <laughs> given you were the person who was actually was, covering the I green I covered hostings. it on Tuesday night, yeah. So what did you learn, Maggie? Well, do you know, it's interesting because Catherine Martin was then on Morning Ireland the next morning after that hostings, which they held online. It was very well organised, I have to say. It went over about three hours or so with both leaders there in camera. And then they did an opening statement and then Green Party members from around the country, sorry, just in the South region, because they're doing it, I think, by kind of Europe European electorate regions um, were able to ask questions a minute for a question and then two minutes each for the answer. So five minutes, so very snappy short. Um, you know, it's it's not really what I would call a cutthroat leadership contest. Um, no. And certainly the next morning, Catherine Martin said, you know, it's good to have this conversation is how she described it. You could even say a polite A polite conversation. conversation. Yeah. Like, you know, the only time when it got anyway slightly juicy I suppose was when they were asked look what are you bringing to the leadership and Eamon Ryan said well look my experience you know I've been leader for nine years I know how government works I know how um, you know how government works within Europe and I know how local government works in relation to, to, to the Dáil and he was basically saying I've got the experience she said it's something to explore. It's good to explore this for the party, but that it is important to get the balance right between holding on to expertise and experience and bringing fresh eyes and encouraging people to step up and being in a lo- long term in a role doesn't necessarily mean you're the right person. That was the only time in that probably three hours that it was kind of in any way. Yeah. You know, I thought it was, often it was, you know, it was for internal consumption, whereas the yeah. big debate on the programme for government was a national issue yes. and had huge sort of ramifications for all of us. And um, for the bits that I looked at, it, it was very much an internal Green Party matter and therefore less interesting. So, mm. but it was very green. For the Who's going to win, Paul? <laughs> that's the third time you've asked me that. Um, my sense of it is that Eamon Ryan will win this contest. I just think that's um, the way it's going to go and the f- that flows from the outcome of the programme for government as well, which was something he was leading and advocating from the off. And I, I think that's um, what will happen. But I think it's going to sort of peter out rather than be sort of, yeah. you know... And there's, because there's another hosting now at the weekend, isn't there, on Saturday? And then probably another two then it must be um, before the ballots will be counted and votes, postal votes have to be sent in by the 22nd of July. Yeah. So the announcement will be on the 23rd of July. But Mihal, it does seem like 
because of what Paul was alluding to with the government formation, we have heard an awful lot, lot from the Green Party yeah. and a lot of conversations yeah. in the last month, haven't we? And the great concern as presented by Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, like when the government negotiations were ongoing and the vote pending, was that if you did have a change of leadership, what would that mean for the stability of the government? Uh, whatever the outcome, that same fear doesn't seem to be palpable at the no. moment now, mm. given that the structures have been put in place. Mm. Yeah, I think that would be absolutely fair. OK, well, um, still a bit, a few weeks, I suppose, left of um, what's going to happen for this uh, new, for this new government. Uh, and you can join us, of course, every week as we bring you a new episode of the Your Politics podcast. But for today, that is it. If you enjoyed us, please do subscribe and leave a comment. Uh, thank you very much for joining us from me, Maggie Doyle, Micheál Lehan and Paul Cunningham. Thanks for listening. <laughs>